You are watching original video by truthdig.com. For more information and resources, visit us on the web at www.truthdig.com. There's more than just Hillary and Trump in town. So, we've got content today. Um, I feel bad for folks that are attending the, both the Hillary or uh, the Trump events while in Philadelphia because there's no content and no substance at all. At all. And with that, um, we're going to dive right into our program. It was important to us that we had a location. Uh, that was accessible, and that's why we're here at the Arch Street Meeting House today as well. So, without further ado, let me introduce uh, somebody that I just informed that if, you know, when we talk about content and meeting content, substance, and the truth, uh, when we organize speeches and talks, uh, I always go to the one and only Chris Hedges. Let me call my No social or revolutionary movement succeeds without a core of people who will not betray their vision and their principles. They are the building blocks of social change. They are our only hope for a viable socialism. They are willing to spend their lives, if they have to, as political outcasts. They are willing to endure repression, and they will not sell out the oppressed and the poor. They know that you stand with all of the oppressed, people of color, in our prisons and marginal communities, the poor, unemployed workers, our GBLT community, undocumented workers, the mentally ill, and the Palestinians, Iraqis, and Afghanis who we terrorize and murder. You stand with all of the oppressed, or you stand with none of the oppressed. They know that when you fight for the oppressed, you get treated like the oppressed. They know this is the cost of the moral life, a life that is not abandoned even if it means you are destined to spend generations wandering in the wilderness, even if you are destined to fail. I was in East Germany, Czechoslovakia, and Romania in 1989 during the revolutions, or in the case of Romania, perhaps an inter-party pooch. These revolutions were spontaneous outbursts by an enraged population that had had enough of communist repression, mismanagement, and corruption. No one from the dissidents themselves to the ruling Communist Party elites anticipated these revolts. They erupted, as all revolutions do, from the tinder that had been waiting years for a spark. These revolutions were led by a handful of dissidents who, until the fall of 1989, were marginal and dismissed by the state until it was too late, as inconsequential. The state periodically sent security to harass them. It often ignored them. I'm not even sure you could call these dissidents an opposition. They were profoundly isolated within their own societies. The state media denied them a voice. They had no legal status and were locked out of the political arena. They were blacklisted. They struggled to make a living. But when the breaking point in Eastern Europe came, when the ruling communist ideology lost all credibility, 
There was no question in the minds of the public about whom they could trust. The demonstrators that poured into the streets of East Berlin and Prague were well aware of who would sell them out and who would not. They trusted those such as Václav Havel, who had dedicated their lives to fighting for an open society, those who had been willing to be condemned as non-persons and go to jail for their defiance, those who stood for something that no one at that time saw as either practical or possible. Our only chance to overthrow corporate power comes from those who will not surrender to it, who will hold fast. <laughs> who will hold fast to the causes of the oppressed, no matter what the price. Who are willing to be dismissed and even reviled by a bankrupt liberal establishment who have found within themselves the courage to say no, to refuse to cooperate. The most important issue in this election does not revolve around the personal traits of Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. It revolves around the destructive dynamic of unfettered and unregulated global capitalism, the crimes of imperialism, and the security and surveillance apparatus. These forces are where real power lies. Trump and Clinton will do anything to serve them. It is up to us to resist. We must refuse to be complicit, even in the act of voting, with the fossil fuel industry savaging of our ecosystem, endless war, oppression of the poor, including the one in five children in this country who are hungry, the evisceration of constitutional rights and civil liberties, the cruel and inhumane system of mass incarceration, and the state-sponsored executions of unarmed people of color in our cities. <laughs> Julian Bender reminded us that we can serve two sets of principles, privilege and power, or justice and truth. The more we make compromises with those who serve privilege and power, the more we diminish the capacity for justice and truth. Our strength comes from our steadfastness to justice and truth, a steadfastness that accepts that the corporate forces arrayed against us may crush us, but that the more we make compromises with those whose ends are privilege and power, the more to affect change. Karl Popper in the Open Society and its enemies wrote that the question is not, how do you get good people to rule? Popper says, this is the wrong question. Most people attracted to power, he wrote, have rarely been above average, either morally or intellectually, and often below it. The question is how do we build forces to restrict the despotism of the powerful? There is a moment, there is a moment in Henry Kissinger's memoirs, do not buy the book, <laughs> where Nixon and Kissinger are looking out at tens of thousands of anti-war protesters who have surrounded the White House. Nixon had placed empty city buses in front of the White House to keep the protesters back. Henry, he said, they are going to break through the barricades and get us, and that is exactly where we want people in power to be.
president yes. because he was scared of movements. <laughs> and if we cannot make the elite scared of us, we will fail. Exactly. The rise of Donald Trump is the product of the disenchantment, despair, and anger caused by neoliberalism and the collapse of institutions that once offered a counterweight to the powerful. Trump gives rage to the legitimate rage of betrayal of the white underclass and working poor. His right-wing populism, which will grow in virulence and sophistication under a Clinton presidency, mirrors the right-wing populism rippling across much of Europe, including in Poland, Hungary, France, and Great Britain. If Clinton wins, Trump will become the dress rehearsal for American fascism. A bankrupt liberal class, as was true in Yugoslavia when I covered the war, and as was true in Weimar Germany, is the great enabler of fascism. Liberals in the name of the practical refuse to challenge parties that betray working men and women in the name of political expediency. Our inability to build a counterweight to the Democratic Party after it abandoned the working class with the passage of the North American Free Trade Agreement in 1994 was our gravest mistake. Hillary Clinton, who embodies a detested neoliberal establishment, can barely fend off one of the most imbecilic and narcissistic candidates in American history. <laughs> skill, she would lose. And if we do not defy the neoliberal order, embodied by Hillary Clinton and the Democratic Party elites, if, as with every other election cycle, we surrender, we ensure the conditions for a terrifying right-wing backlash that will be harsh and the violent mechanisms that will be used to crush the little political space we have left. The tactic of strategic voting begs the question, strategic for whom? Our money drenched, heavily managed elections are little more than totalitarian plebiscites to give a veneer of legitimacy to corporate power. As long as we signal that we are not a threat. As long as we signal that we are not a threat to the established order, as long as we participate in this charade, the neoliberal assault will continue toward its frightening and inevitable conclusion. Alexis de Tocqueville correctly saw that when citizens can no longer participate in a meaningful way in political life, political populism is replaced by a cultural populism of sameness, resentment, and mindless patriotism, and by a form of anti-politics he called democratic despotism. The old forms of democracy are used to mask a political system the philosopher Sheldon Wolin calls inverted totalitarianism. We must build structures of open defiance to the corporate state. It may take as long as a decade for us to effectively confront corporate power. Two years. But without a potent counterweight <laughs> to the neoliberal order, we will be steadily disempowered. Every action we take, every word we learn, must make it clear that we refuse to participate in our own enslavement and our own destruction. cannot be delayed. Our success will be determined not by the number of votes we get in this or any election, but by our ability to stand unequivocally with the oppressed.
freedom throughout history have always charged its defenders with subversion. The enemies of freedom have often convinced large parts of a captive population to parrot back mind-numbing cliches to justify their rule. Resistance to corporate power will require fortitude and ability to march to the beat of our own drum. If we succeed, we will be met with harsher and harsher forms of state repression and vitriolic attacks from the mass media. No revolutionary abandons, no matter what the cost, those he or she defends. We cannot betray those murdered by police in our marginal communities. We cannot betray the courageous dissidents, Julian Assange, Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden, begin 
as I saw in East Germany, with a few Lutheran clergy holding candles as they marched through the streets of Leipzig. It ends with half a million people protesting in East Berlin, the defection of the police and the army to the side of the protesters and the collapse of the Stasi state. But revolutions only happen when a few dissidents decide they will no longer cooperate, when they affirm what we must affirm, when, as Havel said, they choose to live in truth. We may not succeed, so be it. At least those who come after us, and I speak as a father, will say of us, they tried. The corporate forces this habit in the, have us in their death grip will destroy our lives. They will destroy the lives of my children. They will destroy the lives of your children. They will destroy the ecosystem that makes life possible. We owe it to those who come after us not to be complicit in this evil. We owe it to them to refuse to be good Germans. And in the end, I do not fight fascists because I will win. I fight fascists because they are fascists. Thank you. It has to be that there's an underlying current. Do you know that the Dakota Access Pipeline was supposed to run through white people's watershed? Yeah, there was an alternative route. Well, yeah, and they got and that got canceled. Yeah. And they put it through the reservation. What does that tell you? They are second class citizens.